What's up, guys? This is Coach Donnie with ElevateYourself.org. Welcome to another episode of The Dig, where we talk about everything from volleyball, training, and life, and dig deeper behind the person. And today, we have a really special guest. We have the legendary Coach John Dunning from UOP and Stanford Women's Volleyball Programs. And I'm just going to list a few of his many accomplishments in case you don't know who he is. So he is a five-time NCAA championship champion coach, uh, ABCA Hall of Famer. He's coached more Division I final matches than anyone and boasts an 83% career winning percentage, which is insane. So almost eight and a half times out of 10, he's going to win a game. I mean, that, that's incredible. He's also the founder of The Art of Coaching, which is an amazing volleyball coaching organization uh, to help educate, train, and inspire volleyball coaches around the world, like me and uh, many of the listeners out there. So before we get started, uh, let's do our usual volleyball warm-up exercise called the quick set, where I'm just going to fire 10 questions, and the first thing that comes to mind, go ahead and blurt that out. Okay, you ready to go? Yeah. All right. Uh, favorite song? Oh, my goodness. Couldn't pick one. Not off the top of my head. Um... Yeah, this is, I'm not fast. <laughs> That's all right. No one's going to know this song. Uh, I, I won't pick that song. It's okay. Um, I would say Nessun Dorma. Okay. Favorite food? Um, oh my gosh. I love steak. <laughs> uh, what, are, are you a ribeye, uh, Wagyu, New York? What type of steak are you? Uh, filet. If I get okay. my choice, I'm a lucky man that night. I'll take a filet. Okay, cool. I'm more of a, a ribeye guy myself. I, I, I'm a sucker for fat. Um, <laughs> favorite music? Favorite music? Um, I'm just a good old rock and roll guy. Rock and roll, classic. Favorite movie or TV show? No one will give me any kind of credit at all for this being a, you know, a, but I, it has to be um, Caddyshack. Okay. Favorite now, book? And as opposed oh. to that, I, pick, I could pick a different one that is not like that at all. Shaw, Shawshank Redemption. Oh, Just, I love that movie. That's a classic. I've seen that like five times myself. That's a great movie. Yeah. Uh, favorite book? Favorite book. Uh, let's see. I would say favorite uh, area you know, topic area is science fiction. Hmm. Um, I love the Dune series. So uh, Dune, great okay. book. Uh, favorite non-volleyball sport? I love golf. Hmm. Favorite volleyball position to coach? Setter. Favorite volleyball skill to teach? Uh, setter. Uh, favorite volleyball player? Oh my goodness. Um, no, gosh, there are some amazing people. Uh, most exciting player to watch I've ever watched is Murray Louise from Cuba. Oh man, 40, 40, 43 inch vertical. How tall is she? 5'11? No, no, she's like 5'8. Oh my gosh. And you can see her waist at the top of the net. It's just scary. Oh, she's, she's awesome uh, to watch. She hit balls that I've never seen anybody else hit. I'm sure they do. They're, you know, everything gets bigger, faster, stronger. So yeah. she was remarkable, especially in that era. Yeah, legendary. All right, last one. Favorite volleyball coach? Hmm. Wow. There's a pretty good list of coaches. Uh Favorite. That's a tough one. Gosh, Donnie. Uh, <laughs> you got to go with what wins, you know? So Russ, I guess. Russ. And States won the most. Uh, he, I mean, he's the winningest, I think, volleyball coach in Division One history. Um, mm. So you got to go with winning, I guess. Yeah. And he had that, that crazy, was it a three-peat? A three oh, yeah. They won 100, ma 100 plus matches in a row at one point. They had a senior class when they graduated. I mean, they all should be inducted into the Volleyball Hall of Fame. You know, <laughs> they're amazing. That was a crazy group. Yeah. All right. Great job. That was fun. And, you know, I forgot to pass on a message, by the way. Uh, two months ago, I interviewed uh, Brett Almasen, 
and he, I told him that I was I was going to interview soon, and he wanted me to pass this message on to you. He says hi, and he says make sure to look at the camera. <laughs> I don't know what he meant by that, but he's like, tell John to to look at the camera. <laughs> okay, we'll do, Brett. I got it. All right. He uh, yeah, he just retired. Long time at MIDI. He actually started coaching in in uh, Stockton when I was at UOP, mm -hmm. uh, and he has some really, really good things about him as a coach. Yeah. And he just cracked me up all the time. I, I mean, there were times, probably decades, that I never saw him without a cup, cup of coffee in his hand. Oh, yeah. Um, but he's a really, really good, successful, really good coach. Yeah. Because he, he mentored under you, right, when he was in Stockton? Yeah, I, I was involved in the clubs at that time. When I moved to town here from the Bay Area to take the OP job, um, the club – programs were just going Richard Chan or some other people that have been in the, uh, in the Stockton area involved in a long time. And, um, we started a new club and Brett got involved first. His wife, Mimi was a coach in the club before Brett. Yeah. Brett was a, did some other things. He was a banker. Um, but, uh, then he, when he got into it, uh, he's really good with teams. Um, just getting teams to, to go beyond where you might think they might. So, uh, it's fun to watch him coach. Yeah. And here's a, something that you might not know. The, the coaching system that I've learned under was actually kind of through you ultimately. So you mentored Brett. Brett mentored Dan Kwan. And then Dan Kwan mentored me of mm -hmm. like the base system, perimeter, just like very fundamental things like still platform, step shuffle footwork. So I want to thank you personally for just giving me mm -hmm. such a great baseline um, of, of just terminology, efficiency, just really simple things to teach kids. And it was cool, really cool to inherit all that kind of along the way. Volleyball is amazing for that. The, the people that I've run into, one of the, my, my loves about volleyball is that the people in volleyball share. Um, you know, it's, there are lots of people out there around the country sharing great ideas. And right now it's really important because the game, I think, is changing quicker the last five years and I think the next five years than it's ever changed. Yeah. And so people experimenting and trying things and, and, uh, sharing, I, that's, that's a great joy for me about our sport. I hope it keeps up, uh, up doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure it is. And, and with organizations like art of coaching is just going to accelerate the, the exchange of ideas and, and really evolve it faster. Yeah. We're, we're really proud of that. Uh, Russ and Terry and I, you know, we, just chatted about, you know, we're all getting up there a little bit in the years. It's, you know, if you have an opportunity to give back to the sport, when you should take it whenever you can. And um, the thing that we liked about each other was we didn't think that there was a way to do, uh, be a coach. Like there's, there's only one way, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of ways to do it depending on the personalities of the people and their experiences and, so through Art of Coaching, we've been able to kind of try to pass that on and say, go listen and listen to who's tried it different ways. And then you find the way that works for you. That's such a great thing about our country um, and about the sport of volleyball in particular. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And uh, if you guys want to sign up for Art of Coaching, is it's a subscription membership where they get access to lots of great drills, uh, coaching education, coaching philosophy, and content that you guys have created as well as interviewed other coaches, right? Right. A lot of people have wanted to join in. I think we have I'm, I'm between three and 4,000 educational videos on our site um, that uh, people can go in and exchange. And then we have lots of clinics. Um, we did a really fun one on practice design last week or two weeks ago. Um, and I think it'll got some good new material for us that people will enjoy. So That's I awesome. love that part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys want to sign up, uh, check the, the links in the description box where you can uh, sign up through their website, but definitely check it out. I, I'm a part of that. And it's just an, an incredible resource that you can never get enough of if you're a true volleyball junkie. So you if you can, can tell us, you can find that? something out there uh, on the website, you can find something out there that will interest you. I think anybody can. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so if you can tell us a little bit more about yourself, like where you grew up, what hobbies were you into, your family, and so on. Yeah, sure. Um, I grew up in a little tiny town called Sparks, Nevada. It's where the nugget is. 
about a mile from the Nugget and moved to the Bay Area when I was in eighth grade. Um, moved to Sunnyvale. Uh, my dad was worked for the telephone company and what I was into was sports. I, I wanted to play every sport. Um, I played basketball. I loved uh, baseball. And then I ended up taking up golf and that kind of kicked baseball out of it because they're similar seasons. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Fremont High in Sunnyvale and I played basketball for a great basketball coach there. His name's Phil Kelly. He was very successful at Fremont High in Sunnyvale and played golf and played with some great golfers um, through the end of the 60s. And I was a good player. I was zero handicap, played junior tournaments and all that stuff for a long time. And uh, I just love sports. Uh, the other part of me that I, my love has grown. I didn't, I don't know if I knew and understood it much when I was younger as I love math. I'm really, it comes easy to me. Maybe that's why I like it. Um, so most of the courses I took in college were mathematical based, um, got into economics, which is math based and loved it and never thought about coaching once in my life. I don't, I don't know that it ever crossed my mind. I just played and I did what my coaches said. It's, and, um, I really enjoyed playing basketball through junior college and golf through junior college. I had to make some decisions. I went to San Diego state, tried to play on a golf team. They were really good. But I had to get jobs. I wasn't going to get a scholarship. I had to get a, get jobs to work my way through college. My family didn't have the money to make it uh, too simple for me. So I had to work pretty hard, working at a 7-Eleven and doing all kinds of different things. Um, and then when I was about ready to get out of college, I, there's no way to find a teaching job. Um, and I was in the education program at San Diego State, and I continued at San Jose State when I I moved back up here to, um, I got a teaching job at Fremont High where I went to high school. My basketball coach that I played for needed a basketball coach and so they had a math opening and so they pushed those two things together and it worked out. I was really lucky. I don't know if I would have gotten a job because there, there were some really interesting things going on at that time in education um, in terms of money problems and, and a lot of layoffs and stuff. And so. I coached boys basketball for a few years and I coached what they used to call lightweight basketball, C's and D's, um, for sm smaller stature people. Um, and it was really fun. And I helped fill coach JVs and little with the varsity and, and then title nine in the early seventies, um, made it so there was money going to be put into women's athletics in high school. Up until that point there, there wasn't any. Wow or very little. Um, and there were some clubs in Chicago, some in LA. Those are kind of the two hotbeds in the country. And uh, um, I had a group of, of girls come to me and say, would you coach our, our volleyball team? And I said, nah, I, I coach basketball. But I was kind of getting a little bit tired of doing basketball all year round. I thought, you know, I'd like to maybe do two different things. And um, so they, they said, we'll teach you. There was a really neat core of kids there that just wanted to coach. Their, their coach had had a baby and she'd stopped coaching. And, and their assistant coach is the water polo coach. And they're the same season, so he couldn't do it. What I didn't find out until the 35th year reunion of my first high school team was that they'd asked three other people before me who said no. <laughs> And I always thought that was an aus wonderfully auspicious way to start a volleyball coaching uh -huh. career. Um, and, but I stuck with it. And when I walked in the gym, every kid in the gym knew more about volleyball than me, but I'm very curious. Um, and I think I had a knack in some ways for teaching um, for a, a way to try to get people to do things to work, to get better. Um, a lot of shared ideas that I, you know, some coaches maybe wouldn't go through, but the kids really liked it. And Fremont then for 10, 10 years had a really good girls volleyball team, um, won a state championship. And um, the club I started called the Bay Club first started out as Charlie's Volleyball Club. Um, <laughs> Charlie Olson, who, who uh, was in Sunnyvale, and he was a cherry farmer. Um, and he stepped up and gave me $400 to run the club. 
Uh, Los Altos High School had a club, but this was the first open club in Northern California, um, at least that I ever heard of. Um, you know, there are a lot of hidden gems out there in the world. Um, and so I was coaching volleyball all year round at this point, and I had stopped coaching basketball. Um, and I just adored it. I love coaching women. Um, uh, and I love the sport of volleyball. It seemed to fit my brain. I'm really logical that this leads to this leads to this. And so I got on a quest to have the most skilled team around. That's I did. We didn't come. I didn't teach them anything about how to compete. I, I understood systems as I went, but all of it was took a back seat to learning how to teach people how to set the best or have the, be the best passer or be the best hitter. And, and I love that part of it. And so we just spent hours in the gym. And then I went to a clinic at UOP. Uh, Terry Laskevich was the coach at that time. Mm. Um, they had just had an amazing run of four or five years in the final four, hadn't won a national championship, but he was successful enough and driven enough that he, they invited him to become the national team coach. And he took it and he left UOP. Um, I got the job. Um, his, he, I think, pushed pretty hard. He and I got to know each other through going to his clinics out there. And so it was a big step for me. Very lucky. I probably wasn't qualified. Um, <laughs> in some ways, yes, but I didn't know anything about recruiting. Mm -hmm. And I had to learn a lot. And I stayed there for 16 years. Had a, coached a lot of amazing players. Um, first one, the, the amazing Odin family. Yeah. that had, you know, three wonderful players in it. And I got to coach Elena Oden. I recruited her my first year as a freshman, got to coach her her whole career. She went on to be one of the best players in the world um, for two quadri quadrenniums. Um, and she was an amazingly gifted, uh, just a great sense about the game, where to go, what, how to, what to see, what to look at, how to make choices that are going to win for you. and. Um, and she brought it, helped, brought a lot of success early that we enjoyed. And then Ted Leland, coach, who was the AD at UOP, um, he, I worked for him for several years, and then he went to Stanford. And then when Stanford had an opening, Ted knew me, and I wasn't a risk because he knew who I was. And he hired me, and I went to Stanford then, and I coached there for 16 years and was lucky enough to coach Olympians and coach a bunch more great players. The the last group dominated college volleyball for the last four years, mm -hmm. uh, won the national championship three times. And I coached them as freshmen and they won four freshman starters winning the final four has never, nothing happened like that before. Um, and those kids went on They're I'm sure going to be very successful internationally and with our national team. And so that's been kind of my path through life. I coached 13s and 14s for a long time. With, and 12s because my two daughters grew up they were both setters mm. and I coached their teams and not in high school not in 15s or 16s um, and my uh, they both played in college and my wife Julie is she's been my partner through all of this and probably more so than anybody that anybody knows she was the key thing in my life behind me to help me to have a career that was very enjoyable yeah. Well, that's me. That's my story. <laughs> Man, that's such a, an awesome story. Um, very well chronologically set out so we can follow along. And I didn't realize that you were recruited to Stanford by the athletic director. So can you tell us about, because like if I know for the new coach, Kevin Hamley, I know he, he applied for it and that's usually how most of the processes go. So how did you decide to go from UOP to Stanford, even though you were already really successful at UOP? Um, family, uh, you know, the UOP one was the, the one different decision that my wife wanted me to take the job because I was a, at Fremont, I was a math teacher. So I graded 150 papers a night. Yeah. I coached girls volleyball and I coached a club that had grown and gotten big. And we had two little kids. There were three, two and five at the time. And she saw the handwriting on the wall and she said, you have to make your hobby your job mm. or you're going to have to quit your hobby. We have children. Mm -hmm. And so the UOP thing came up and she said, 
you're taking this job if they give it to you. And they did. And I took it and I learned a lot. Um, and then uh, Stanford, um, Don Shaw left uh, coaching the women's team at Stanford. They, he had a lot of success, but he stopped and he ended up coaching the men's team for quite a while. And uh, But the job came open in, in uh, the end of June, right before going to JOs to recruit. And uh, they needed a coach quickly. And so he called me and said, this is what happened. Um, are you going to be interested? And I said, let's talk. Uh, I, you know, there's, it's the only school I would have left UOP for. Mm. And the, the reason is because my wife's from San Jose. and Her whole family was San Jose based. And we moved out of the area and traffic at that time was awful. Mm -hmm. And you couldn't hardly get from San Jose to UOP in, you know, any reasonable time. And yeah. So she got to move back to San Jose, be around her family. So anybody would say a job offer, a good job offer at, at Stanford, how can you pass it up? Well, you're, they're right. It's a wonderful place to work. But I could have passed it up because I loved UOP. Mm. I love the atmosphere in the athletic department and the school. And I love the program. And had, it was joyous about my experience there, but my my wife and Stanford offering what they offered in terms of um, just the the big image of what Stanford is, you know, we decided to go over there, and the 16 years there were great. Yeah, yeah, and I can't wait to hear more stories from your your Stanford run. Um, on a side note, uh, when I first met you, uh, you know Scott Akimoto. So he was one of the older uh, volleyball guys I knew. And for me being like 19, that's 18 and 19 is when I got bit by the bug, like six open gyms a night. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get enough. And I just happened to meet Scott through Kevin Huang, like some MIDI guys. And I think he yeah. knew Brett. And then he kind of took me under his wing and would just invite me and introduce me to these crazy legendary people like you Kim Odin, and he would invite me to this open gyms. And then I see Matt Lyles. I'm like, mm -hmm. I'm just in this a 19 year old kid in all of these people. And everyone was so nice. And he, he calls me and says, Hey, you want to watch Stanford practice? I'm like, how do I even get in? He's like, just follow me. Mm -hmm. So then we sit and I'm shaking, right? I'm a 19 year old kid. I'm like, how am I in this national championship atmosphere? And then you come in, you shake my hand, you greet your, you, you know, you introduce yourself and you're super kind. And you give me a copy of your practice plan. It's like five or six pages long. <laughs> and for me, it was my first year coaching as an assistant. So I go from just trying to beat these high school kids that I used to play with, trying to prove myself to like, wow, okay, this is what a practice looks like. And this is a template for me to follow. So I was, you know, studying the diagrams, looking at the notes. And at that time, um, you guys were, luckily, I think it was in the, the pre or mid season. So it was a lot more breakouts and less playing. And I remember specifically Ogana Nimani, you had her standing on a box and just working on arm swing. That was it. And then you had them play uh, threes on a men's net at one portion. So just really dynamic things that I would have never thought of. And then we talk afterward. And then ever since then, um, you've always, I've always, uh, you've always been gracious enough to allow me to come observe your practice. So I would make my rounds. I would go watch it because I, I was a teacher also. So I had like Thanksgiving off and, so every holiday I had, I would go watch Brett because my season, we, we were a mid-tier team. We would get knocked out like quarterfinals in NCS. So then right after that, I would go watch Brett and then I would go watch you. Um, but that was just really a great time. And another practice I remember was when uh, you had Alex Kleinman on your team. And that was the first time I learned about the concept of uh, jump counting as a way to manage uh, workload. Uh, and that, right. that was a really cool concept for me um, that you, were, you talked to me about um, after practice. So. It's, it's just funny how I got introduced to you that way. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Practice is a very sacred place. It's the thing I enjoy the most. Yeah. Um, planning for it, thinking about it, talking to my staff about it. And then it took me hours to write every practice plan, probably mm -hmm. two hours every day. I put into writing it, handwriting it every day. And um, you got to see how thorough it was. It wasn't a short practice plan, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, and whenever anybody came into our practice, you know, I wanted my players to respect that place, um, that our program respected that, that place, the, the practice set up. And 
anybody who walked in, we greeted. Then we got to the point after watching Marv Dunphy, the Pepperdine men's coach do this, um, we got to the point where whenever anybody walked into our gym, we introduced our whole team to that person or mm. group of people um, to welcome them to the gym um, so that they would feel comfortable, that, that we wanted to share our ideas with them, and we wanted them to see how hard we practice, too, yeah. um, then, so that their respect for our game and our school and our program would grow. So the process you went through, to me, was very important because I just love practice. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, thanks for sharing that. And I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm like surprised, but not surprised at even how much thought you put into the guests that you have in practice and viewing practice as sacred. I think something that I can learn from as it's an, it's, it's a privilege first, right. For us to even practice. And then also the, the idea of, we are here to also not just work hard for ourselves, but work hard for the people that took time out of their day to come watch us play. So I, right. I, I love that, that complexity of even, even viewing practice like that. It's, it's the way we wanted our program to be. It's the way I tried to be. And again, I have to give credit to Marv Dunphy. He's an amazing, amazing man. Yeah. Um, and for all the success he had at Pepperdine and with the national team with, um, um, give him some credit for that because it was a it was a it was the right thing to do if it fit who I I was you know and that you know no one else has to go do it um, it just fit me and it fit our program and so I'm I'm lucky I ran across it yeah yeah a funny side story of Marv um, so I actually went to San Jose that was my undergraduate alma mater so I went to San Jose State played for the men's club team there um, from 2005 and 2009. And we're so lucky in 2008 uh, that we were pro the S SJSU was processing Olympic athletes. Um, so the USA team was using our main event center to practice. And I remember getting a phone call from one of my buddies who just happened to be an event staff student there. And he says, Hey, the USA team is practicing right now. And wow. I'm working at Sunglass Hut. I'm just trying to pay my bills. I tell my manager, I'm like, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I know you need me, but I got to go. <laughs> and luckily, I was a pretty hard worker. So she she was uh, nice enough to just let me go. So I raced down to San Jose. Was, I was working at New Park Mall, which is in Newark. So I raced down to San Jose, luckily only 20 minutes. And then um, he sneaks me into the event staff. And this is obviously a, a, a private practice because it's just me, him, and then one other volleyball buddy on the team. And so we're sitting there wow. watching this three-hour practice. And I bring my crusty volleyball from my from my trunk for the for the players to sign. And right after the game uh, practice ends, Hugh doesn't look very happy because he's like, "Who are these guys?" <laughs> he, he goes off and talks to his other coaches. The first one who greets me is Marv. He goes up to me and he gives me an American flag pin. He said, "Thanks for coming to watch our practice, even though I'm, I'm pretty sure I wasn't allowed to be there." And then all the other players proceed to come up to me and say hi and shake my hand. Loy Ball, Riley Salmon, Reed Pretty, all these guys. And it's just such, like volleyball is just such an awesome community and such a, a culture that's always giving back and setting great examples for our youth to continue to pass that along. Um, and so I'm not surprised yeah. that you also received that inspiration from Marv and, and he's just such a stand-up guy. Yeah. And that's why we started it. I walked into Maples Pavilion uh, when the, Met, the Pepperdine men's team were there and they were in the middle of practice and they took a water break and I'm kind of standing there wanting to be like in the shadows. I don't yeah. want to bother Marv, you know, and pretty soon his whole team's coming over, shaking my hand, welcoming me, me to their practice. Yeah. And as soon as I felt that, I started doing it myself with everyone who walked into our gym. So you and I experienced the exact same feeling, <laughs> and how yeah. cool it was, and how much you can add to other people's lives just by doing simple things. Yeah. And that teaches so much to our players, too, that to be conscious of, of other people and like the lessons that the young athletes are learning. It's like, okay, I, I need to take my time out of the day to thank people and to, to be gracious to them as well. So uh, right. just so many lessons for everyone to learn that are involved. Uh, one thing that's been, I've been so lucky living in the Bay area is just being able to watch Stanford women's volleyball as much as I wanted. And there was a, a series of years where 
you had great runs and then some really tough losses in the final fours. Uh, could you walk us through, like, how do you navigate that as a coach of where the, that title is just right there. It's just looking at you and then it just falls out. And, and yeah, how do you, how do you navigate that? Do, do you like when you're in the moment, is that something you're anticipating? Um, and then after it happens, like how do you recover and move on from that? Yeah, there's a, there's a whole bunch of interesting thoughts I have just thinking back about those moments of all the things that my teams accomplished in terms of win and loss, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Cause there's so many other ways to look at it. You know, there's so many ways to think about what you do every day and what it means and what they learn and how it affects people. And, um, but one of the things I'm really proud of is we, we, I did coach teams that in 32 years that got to the final four 12 times. Yeah. And that's a lot of luck and a lot of hard work put together to have that happen because there's so many good teams. Mm -hmm. Well, 10 of the 12 times we won in the semifinals, um, which is ridiculous because the teams are all prepared. Yeah. They are all so good, but we won 10 out of, out of 12 times to get to the final match. And we only won five out of 10 getting there. Um, so that's not quite as good, but the, the ones that the, the particular streak you're probably talking about is in, 2006, seven and eight, we had a remarkable team at Stanford. Um, uh, until this last run by Stanford, um, which has to go down as one of the best teams that's ever played college volleyball. They won three out of four years and they placed third the uh, fourth year, um, their second year in their progression. That probably the two, two of the best teams that ever played we're in five, six, seven, and eight. We're Penn State and Stanford, and we played them in in two thousand seven, two thousand eight. We had Cynthia Barbosa, Alice Kleiman, Feluca Akinradawo, Bryn Keough. I mean, we had Cassidy Lickman. We had these great teams, and we lost in six to Nebraska. Um, they have a pretty good outside hitter for the last ten years on the national team. Who's played in two or three Olympics? That's that was the star of that team that beat us great jump server. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm just playing with you a little bit to see if you know who I'm talking about. Yeah. Jordan Larson. Yes, I just watched sir. the highlight of that match. That was, that was a heartbreaking match. That was tough. Heartbreaking. And we had Sacramento, we tried to host in 2007. They were trying to bring one back to the West coast, but Sacramento bid on it for Arco center where the Sacramento Kings used to play. Hmm. And so, so they got the bid, but we lost in five to Penn State there. Um, and then we lost in three to Penn State in 2008, which is that, that amazing streak with, they had six, you know, all Americans, their whole starting lineup was an all American and ours was pretty close to that, but those are two of the best teams that have ever played. Yeah. Um, and so that's a, so, you know, I have so much respect for the moment, so much, um, you know, that I'm, I'm so grateful for having been there to have a chance to who I've coached five or six Olympians and who gets to do that? I mean, how lucky am I that I got to do that? And yeah, I'm at great schools that have an opportunity to do that, but still you can't take it for granted. And then you have to really see it for what it is. And I did. And it was a great joy to go to the gym every day to see them do things that I've, you've never seen anybody do before. Mm -hmm. Like Feluca Akinradawo is so lightning fast. She's the best yeah. middle in the world for like 10 or 12 years now. Mm -hmm. And um, she just did things where you turn and look at the person next to you and go, did that just happen? There's no way she's that fast or hit it over that player um, that's trying to block her there. So great respect for that, but heartbreak um, for a group of people who play second three times in a row. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember walking in the very first year to Stanford that we lost in 2006, like two days later, and we placed second in the country. This is, you know, an amazing accomplishment that anyone else would be joyous. And somebody in the Stanford building who's so used to winning in so many different sports, walked, first person I saw walked by, by me and said, geez, coach, I'm really sorry. Um, and I, I kind of looked at him and thought, I want to strangle this person yeah. 
that they need to have respect for these athletes for what they were able to do. I mean, it wasn't easy trying to beat Nebraska in 2006 in front of 15,000 Nebraska fans and 300 Stanford fans. Yeah. That's nuts in Nebraska. They're crazy. Yeah. And so there was an advantage there that we were playing against and that it was great volleyball, but it's heartbreaking um, to have those kids work that hard. Me as their coach, not be able to help them to the point that they got over the hump and won. And I don't have nightmares about anything that I coat any loss or anything like that. Um, but I'll, once in a while I'll be just sitting daydreaming and think about volleyball and think about those moments and realize, um, like how hard I cried, sorry, <laughs> after okay. the match in 2006. Yeah. Um, I got a little hardened after that. It's a little, you, you get to know how I should react and be a mature person and all that stuff. Um, but I mean, I cried for a long time after we lost in 2006, which yeah. I'm not going to do now. Um, you know, I, I would look at it a little differently than that. I'd be happier for the moment because it was ridiculously cool. Um, but it was, you know, you're right. There were some moments that could have been better. And every coach, John Wooden even, has, has you know, received that end of the, yeah. the trophy. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I remember watching on TV because I couldn't go to Nebraska and – I, I struggled with that for a whole week. Like just, just being a local guy, being a Bay area, Stanford guy, Stanford is just so Bay area, like very progressive, inviting, yeah. intelligent. And, and those players just reflected that. And it was, I, I felt like the stamp, that group was just a different style of volleyball too. I mean, Fluka just brought, a, like you said, the speed and certain angles that you just don't see and our ability to rise to a ball. Um, and then Cassie Lickman, the, the jack of all trades, just you just don't know where she's going to play. And when she does it, it's yeah. awesome. It was just a different style. And so it's, it's, it's even though you guys were one of the top teams in the country, you still had that underdog vibe. It was like, yeah, this is a group of different people that are going to get it done. And yeah, I, yeah. a lot of fans, we all, we, yeah, it, it was, we, we watched with a group of friends from San Jose State. And uh, it was a great match, though. I mean, still an incredible accomplishment. It, it, it was a good match. We had a team in 2014 when Inky and Maddie Bug and Jordan Burgess and uh, Brittany Howard, they were all um, um, juniors. And um, we ended up playing Penn State in the semifinals. Um, and we'd won like 34 matches in a row that year. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we hadn't lost until next to last weekend of the season. We played um, Washington. And uh, um, and then we lost in the semifinals, but we were beat up by that time. I mm. mean, Cassidy could hardly walk. And, yeah. you know, Alex um, had some physical issues. So did Gabby Ailes. Um, and it, I felt really badly for that team because they functioned at, at a ridiculously high level the whole season. It's one of those teams where you're looking at them going – you know, maybe we should like not play a couple matches so we can get a rest <laughs> or something here before yeah. we, we go on to the big stuff. But they used it up every day, the whole season long. And there were no breaks for them. We had to set Alex that much. We had to have Cassidy pass and hit and set. And, yeah. and Gabby was a truly amazing libero. And so uh, I felt badly for that group because they put so much out there and they were so good. The, they had there was a great team atmosphere they just gathered themselves closer and closer together and the better the closer we got the better we got and so that was one of those joyous things as a coach and I felt badly for them that we didn't end it on a better note yeah, yeah. that reminds me of a story of uh, Jared Elliott from Texas and when I went to the the USA HP coaching clinic um, he shared a story of where he had a streak where he made it to the finals a couple of times and just was struggled to finish. And his last, his last defeat in the, the championship match, he just went to his office and cried and he submitted his letter of resignation to the AD and the AD said, no, you're not quitting. <laughs> He's like, wow. we want you here. Like you, you, this is something to be proud of. And we are with you all the way. This is not a failure. And, and he came back and is still coaching at a super high level. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, one and kind of transitioning to how you've 
kind of moved forward from those difficult experiences because then you you fast forward to your last championship where I would say even more challenges but uh, you know having one of the top players in the nation um, get injured to the point where she couldn't play um, the opposite I forgot her name uh, well uh, she was the head uh, oh uh, Haley Hodson Haley yeah. Hodson yeah and then you guys end mm -hmm. up winning that year with a, a a once again a different combination that's never been seen with Mena Lutz playing a little bit of right side and middle and just this this weird really cool mutant of a of a volleyball system just to adapt to that yeah. so you lose one of your best players only to come back to win a national championship and to me following your career I felt like it was built it was just a nice triumph and to show the perseverance that you've had through working through some of those losses of, of the times with Cassie Lickman's group and Alex Kleiman, and then showing coaches like, Hey, we're still moving forward. We can still be better and so on. So what was that journey like kind of from though, from that, those moments in Nebraska to your, uh, your last championship match? Yeah, that's a, it's a real interesting uh, fairy tale kind of story. Um, mm -hmm. The year before um, all those kids graduated except Inky Mm -hmm. because Inky went and got hurt before her senior year um, with playing with the national team to our ACL. And she didn't play when Maddie and Brittany and Jordan were seniors. And that's the year that Haley came in mm -hmm. and Inky had to sit out the whole year. It was just a horrifying experience because those were like the four musketeers. They were really close. they had had some great, they had some great years too. They, they could have won another final four in, in uh, 2000 and, 13 when they got beat by Penn State and then Penn State went on and won the final four but we lost a very close in five in Kentucky to Penn State um, and that was really hard on Maddie and Jordan and Brittany but Inky didn't get to play that year and and Inky she got hurt and she had to rehab and she got to come back for her fifth year um, and that was my last year um, and her last year um, and Kelsey Humphreys was the other senior on that last team. Um, but um, Haley Hodson came in and that, that uh, in 2015, and which she's a, she was a marvelous, highly recruited, wonderful, strong player. Um, and she ended up getting hurt at the end of that season and, and then didn't ever really come back and play um, physically some different things, um, concussion, at the end of her freshman year, and then she had real bad shin problems um, in, in, in the year in between. And she tried to play for about half of the 2016 season, not half, um, preseason through the end of September, I think. And, and then she ended up stopping and not playing at all the rest of the season. And uh, Michaela Keefe, got hurt about the same time. She was another left side player. So uh, Catherine Plummer was playing opposite halftime and we were running a six, two and Catherine was a setter opposite her whole life. Mm -hmm. And she had never primaried pass, to my knowledge. I watched her playing club and she set and hit and did the same thing in high school. And, and uh, we had no choice. Well, we had choices, but, the choice to me that made absolute sense is we were like seven and six losing to, and, and we um, switched away from the six, two to a five, one with Plummer on the left, Jenna Gray setting a five, one Kelsey coming in for Moretta in the back row on the opposite side. And uh, immediately without ever practicing the lineup, we switched to that in the middle of a match against Arizona, which, I don't do. I'm a very much plan for everything, figure it out. This is how we do things. This is how we adjust. So me to just go off the wall like this, my other coaches probably looked at me like I had just, I was going to die somehow <laughs> or something. And uh, immediately we got better. And then the next day we got better. And all of a sudden we're looking at Catherine Plummer going, no, you should have been playing left side your whole life. <laughs> um, but playing opposite on the beach, playing indoor on the opposite side, she had a wonderful cut, just hit the ball like this so naturally. 
Yeah. And she's so strong that she was the key thing. As long as she could take all that volleyball IQ knowledge that she had as a player and put it into a position she'd never played under pressure. Cause if she played bad, we probably gonna, we're going to lose. Hmm. And that's a lot to put on an 18 year old who'd never even played the position before. And she was marvelous at it. And we've seen the result of it for the last three years that everybody tried to stop her. They knew what she was going to do and they just couldn't stop her. You watch her in the final match and the best team in the country, you would go, why are you blocking her that way? Why are you digging her that way? Can't you see what she's going to do? Yeah. No, you can't. You just can't see it coming. And she's so strong that she's that hitter that can also overpower the digger, not only the block, but the digger with ball speed. Mm -hmm you wouldn't be prepared for it. She'd look like she just hit a cut and most people who hit it offline cutting don't hit it as hard. You yeah. can't. And she just rips it so that it just thuds when it hits her hand and it just bounces off diggers mm -hmm. and she can hit it at ridiculous angles. But yeah. she, that was what she learned as she went through the next three years. And Kevin did a great job with that team. And with her, she kept learning and getting better. But all of a sudden, Morgan Hentz started playing at a whole nother level. Adriana Fitzmorris, who came in, um, uh, started playing at another level. Um, Jenna Gray stepped up playing a 5-1. Kelsey was marvelous in the back row. Um, and it all gelled, and no one was even paying any attention to us because our record was so bad compared to anybody who was going to get in the Final Four. And uh, having been seven and six when we lost that match to Arizona. And then we basically didn't really lose again. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we lost one more match to the Bruins. Um, but it was, we really were the team that no one has still paid attention to even when we got to the tournament because the big 10 was awesome that year. Mm. Um, Texas was awesome that year. And um, so we were in the, the regional going to Wisconsin to play Wisconsin, going to Madison. And that arena is crazy for the Badgers. Sold out, 6,000 people. You can hardly breathe. It's so loud. And they crushed us the first two games. Hmm. Um, but we started to have the wheels turn in the first and second, second set. We went in the locker room and Inky looked at the freshman in the eye and said, I trust you. I believe in you. Uh, I know everybody believes in you that's here believe in yourselves, go play volleyball like you're supposed to play. Hmm. And having the best player in the country, look at those freshmen in the eye. It just, uh, an old expression that I used since I was a kid that I heard it just charged their chicken. Hmm. I mean, it just made them go crazy. And we played great in set three and one and ended up beating Wisconsin. Um, they had a pretty darn good setter that year, too. I believe she's on the national team doing pretty well right now. You know who I'm talking about? Is that Carlini? Yeah. 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 Super and athletic. A ridiculous competitor. Haggerty yeah. on the left side. And when we escaped Wisconsin, people, we got to the Final Four and people were still discounting us. Yeah. Because that's the first big win we had the whole year. We beat teams, but we didn't beat the teams that were the elite that are going to be at the Final Four. Mm -hmm. And we had to play Minnesota, who was ridiculously good. They had the player of the year on their team, um, an outside hitter who was quite good. Um, and we ended up being ahead the whole match and beating them in four. And we just got better and better and better. And, you know, it's really interesting. My number one goal almost every year I coach that I can remember, I'm sure there are some years I've forgotten about what the reality was, um, was my number one goal is to be the team that improved every week of the season because it's mm. almost impossible to do that. You get to a week where you're going to play two really good teams and you're preparing for those teams and you forget to get better. Mm -hmm. Well, we would come in and say, we're going to prepare for these teams, but here are the things we have to do because we're going to get better this week mm. and we're going to have to play them. Or when someone gets hurt or when this or this happens, you know, you're traveling a really hard road trip and it's impossible to improve every week of the season well this team after we changed the lineup we got better every week of the season mm -hmm. it was amazing to watch and we got better the week of the finals yeah we played minnesota and it was at a level that everybody then was going maybe they are for real and that they just beat a great team you know with um 
a great coach. And so we went on to play Texas in the finals. And I don't know who, how much money was on the line out there, but it wasn't on us. <laughs> uh, Texas was really good. They had great players and we had a good game plan and we ended up getting ahead of them and getting the pressure switched on to them a little bit more than they were used to, I think. Mm -hmm. And the freshmen were ridiculous. I mean, we match play at match point. We pass a really tough serve, a bad ball. Kelsey bump sets from the 25 foot line and P Plummer just goes up against this enormous block that was just standing waiting for her and just hammers it off the top of them into the bleachers mm -hmm. um, for the win. And I just gives me chills when I think about it, yeah. but it was, that was a, a very much a fairy tale kind of a deal. And those four fresh freshmen since then proved that they were the best players in the country at their position, all four of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was a fairy tale to follow along with. And I hope one day when, if you know, when you, if you write a, a book about that experience, I think you can make a whole book of just about that journey. And it, it kind of reminds me of the U S men's team from 2008. Um, I don't know if you follow the, the men's program, but right. A team that, had a bunch of people that weren't highly recruited internationally, a few really key players like Lloyd ball, but even then he wasn't an, an addition until later in that, that quad, but uh, they weren't even ranked top 10. And then every year. Uh, and he, the funniest thing was, I remember um, watching an interview with Hugh McCutcheon, his uh, first year in this quad, um, they're asking him, it's like, Oh, we noticed you don't have Sean Rooney in your roster. Uh, Cause he was one of the top college players, you know, it, are you going to recruit him? He's like, well, if he wants to play with us, he can. If not, you know, we, we as long as we have the guys that want to work hard in the gym, we're going to be just fine. Yeah. And so that was the culture. And to see them kind of go under the radar and slowly rise over the four years, um, the World League right before the Olympics, they end up beating Brazil, which was ranked number one. Even then, people didn't think that. They thought that was a fluke. Then they sneak into the Olympics. They beat Russia in five, and they beat Brazil for the gold medal. And it was kind of going back to the um, read pretty always talked about how it was like a no pressure situation. It was pressure obviously because it's the Olympics, but the, when you don't, when the world thinks you're not supposed to be there, you can kind of just focus on just playing and just being better and just connecting and, and just competing. Was that similar to yep. kind of how you feel like your, your, uh, your team had a little bit less pressure because people just didn't expect you guys to be that good. I think that's part of it. Clearly that was the case that we were not on people's radar, as I said, and, and that we might've even looked at it as the underdog, but when you've already won so many program national championships and all the players that have been there, you're not really the underdog when you have that Jersey on, you're never yeah. going to be the underdog at Penn state, no matter what anybody says, yeah. you know, they just expect things to happen. Mm -hmm. And so, um, part of, um, that season or that the how you would look at that was that maybe we did sneak up on people um just a little bit no doubt about it but you know one of the reasons i think we were as successful as we were is we always said that you you have to learn how to fight off dis off distractions there are all kinds of distractions and you can talk about pressure whatever way you want but we never talked about pressure as pressure we talked about that there's distractions. The further you go through the tournament, the bigger the match you play, there's more distractions. Mm -hmm. You're out of your rhythm because you're in the playoffs, because you're being interviewed by ESPN, you know, because people are talking about you, they're taking pictures, they were having an All-American banquet, and all these things are just distractions in the end. Mm -hmm. You know, your parents are there in the hotel with you. That's not normal. Yeah. You know, you're at college and all of a sudden you, there's this entourage that's happening. And so we, part of our culture was to never have it be, never talk about it like it was big. Everybody yeah. knew it was big, but, you know, talk about the fact that you, when you get to the playoffs, you have to be in character. And if you're not act, act the way you always act. If you yeah. are feel pressure you can't let your roommate know it. You, if you're going to give us a chance to win, um, 
you have to understand you can't be distracted by the things that are there that didn't distract you all year that will be the reason you lose now. And most of the, my friends that went, they'd look at all the teams and go, you guys were the most relaxed team here. Mm. You were the ones, I think, or we were the ones that were in our minds, take, not taking ourselves so seriously. Mm. No, you can't tell a kid that playing for the final, for the final national championship or playing in the final four isn't big. You're, they're going to look at you like you're a liar because it is. They've dreamt about it their whole life, mm. you know, to do that. Just like the men's team playing in the Olympic gold medal match, they may have snuck up on people, but those people have dreamt about this their whole life. Yeah. And they have to come up with ways to prepare themselves to handle that moment. And I think, um, I think a lot of times we handled the moment. And there were certainly times we didn't. Penn State showed us the moment several times that they were more ready to handle it than us or they were just better than we were or whatever. Um, but, but working at and having part of your culture be, I have to learn how I practice, how I think everything is, is going to make me believe myself when I have to handle the moment. Hmm. You know, and here's a funny story that has to do with all this, if it's okay. Sure. Um, I had a, several, lots of the final season or end of the season turn, NC2A tournament runs we had. I would take one of my assistant coaches and say, okay, you've had some different jobs this year. You do what you've been doing, but I'm going to add a job to you. My, I'm your job through the playoffs. You watch me, you pay attention to me. And there's no saying that I know what I'm doing. I can be distracted too. I can be out of character. So your job is me. If I'm out of character, you tell me. Mm. And they did. And there was a really funny, um, we had a, a final match um, that was pl being played at one o'clock. So breakfast was our, our pregame meal. Mm. Um, and we were sitting at breakfast, having a meal, getting ready to go to the arena with 18,000 people. Um, and this is where we're just supposed to be chill. It's just our thing. We're going to, you know, we're going to be in character and be who we are. And I'm sitting and I'm apparently losing my mind for a minute because I'm arguing with the person across from me about something. And this coach on our staff walked over to me and whispered in my ear and he said, um, come outside with me for a minute. And I said, no, I'm having a conversation here. He said, exactly. Come outside with me for a minute. And he said, you told me to, he got me outside and he said, you told me to do this. Um, so I'm doing it. You're out of character. You're going to ruin this for us. Um, uh, you go sit outside at this place. I've scouted it out. And it's like this little atrium with trees and ferns and stuff. And he said, go sit there for an hour and I'll come get you. I won't let us, you're going to be on time. And by the time he got back, I was like counting the birds and looking at the plants. And I was back in character, <laughs> certainly relaxed. And I did a good job that day. We did win. And a little bit of it certainly probably had to do with the fact that I wouldn't have done my job right if this mm. person who had this job hadn't interviewed. And it had to be really scary to walk up to me that in that moment and go, come with me. Mm. And everybody's looking at us like, what? <laughs> wow. So that's a story. That is great, man. So many gems from there. I I'm going to steal that trick there. Uh, I'm going to give my assistant coaches full reign to, to keep me in check and, and, and to, to make sure I'm a character. And I like how you, uh, it was like a paradigm shift on pressure instead of viewing it as pressure as, as just a distraction. Cause Distraction feels more tangible. It feels more re easily removable, whereas pressure can feel daunting and it can feel almost boundless, like no edges, where it's like, well, I'm being absorbed here. So I, right. I like that. Yeah. Um, when you, when you, to me, when you, you talk about pressure, the way the world reacts to it, it's almost like it takes your breath away when you say it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, I, oh my gosh. Um, yeah, this is enormous. Um, when no, all this is, is this, it's this yeah. thing. And part of what I have to do in order to play at this level is I have to have a way to handle this thing. Hmm. And so this is the way I handle it. And for us, it was be in character. Um, for coaches, doesn't matter who it is, what style you're in, you, your team is a reflection of you. 
Yeah. Um, it's just because you're all part of it. And, and head coaches, all coaches have big roles. And if they look at you and you're different than you are just because the moment is bigger, you're handicapping them. You're making their, their chances for, for success significantly less. Yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 So true. Um, going back to um, the championship match where you, you last won with that group, um, I remember watching that and seeing, I wonder if this was part of your specific system of being just a block dominant team. Cause from what I remember, I think you had like a three middle system where even though uh, Moretta was playing right side, I think in rotation one, for example, she could run the three, she would run like a, an angled one. So kind of push starting left and kind of come in at a really weird angle and then just crush it. Cause she was so long. And then, so one, I think you guys blocked lights out. And I just didn't think people have ever seen. I mean, of course, when you get three middles, three really good middles that are big, skilled, and confident yeah. in some combination, people are, I don't think anyone's ever seen that. So was that like a conscious development as a strategy or did that also kind of naturally evolve from, from that combination? Um, it, it just kind of fit us. Um, you know, Adriana... Uh, Fitzmorris, who's who's one of the middles in that that uh, setup that you're talking about, um, she is the only player I've ever coached. I'm sure Logan, Tom, and Agana could do whatever they wanted to do, but in terms of what you were going to do in a game, she's the only player I've ever coached that could hit every set. Mm. Like she can hit quicks, she can hit wide slides, fast slides. She could hit a hit a hut, you know. And so Moretta was an unusual. Um, opposite when she's stuck over there on the corner, you stacked your, your serve receive over here. And, and usually you run slides out of it over there. Well, we'd have the other person run a slide and have Moretta just hit threes, which they were absolutely unstoppable. She yeah. hit like 800 on threes for the season. Yeah. And so we, our offense, we kind of pieced it together um, in a very unusual way. Um, and um, yeah. So, uh, yes, it was a very special kind of different convoluted system we ran, but it was because the players were so unique. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I remember when she would go back to serve, she would also hit a D ball, right. in just that one rotation. And that yeah. was another element now back row attacks are finally getting incorporated in the last three or four years, but you were kind of one of the first to make it a primary and I remember, I can tell teams weren't used to seeing that because from what I remember, it was, it was almost like a 50% chance that she was going to get set because it was so effective, but teams still wouldn't know how to deal with that. Right. Whereas the yeah. men's game, they're, they're going to see that very often as just part of the offense. So was right. that also a conscious choice of like, okay, she's this percentage on the D ball after she serves setter, or was, was that just up to Jenna to decide? Um, uh, well, our offense is interesting because I love it. And we would talk before every match. I mean, I just think offense, think setters, think connection between the hitters and how you can make offense unique or what makes your team unique. And, and Cassidy was the assistant who was in charge of our setters that year because Cass was a setter and Cass was trained by me, um, at least in terms of setting, she had a lot of good coaches when she was younger, but she, I think she grew a lot as a setter uh, in our program. And, and uh, Cass's job was to track our offense mm. by rotation in system and out of system, because she knew having been a player that your brain as a setter doesn't always process what actually happened accurately because mm -hmm. you get impressed by different things and you have habitual ways you approach things like in this situation, I'm going to set this. Well, yeah, but it hadn't worked yet today, so that didn't make sense. And so stat, Cass would stat our offense and be able to show Jenna, this is – we haven't set middle once in transition in this rotation. You have to do it. Hmm. Or you, you – I don't care if they're counting on stopping Moretta on a three. Set it anyway because they are not going to stop her. Mm -hmm. You're great at setting it, and you have to set her even though you think you're oversetting it. Mm -hmm. Just do it, please. You know, and no, we know they're going to, they know that Inky's going to do this. And, but if you set a good enough ball, they can't stop her. She's too mm -hmm. fast. She's like Feluca. Yeah. 
Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's just a fun part of it. So Cass was great at not giving Jenna too much, giving Jenna freedom to make her own choices, but giving her, her enough information to be accurate in the moment of what was really happening in the game. Hmm. And I love that part of the game. Um, so Cass would sit next to me. I'd kind of listen to what she was doing and she'd ask me once in a while what I thought. And, and Jenna is a total competitive gamer. Hmm. Um, she's going to make the right choices because she's thinking ahead. Some players can't do that, but yeah. she's like an assassin out there. Yeah. Um, she's thinking about a way that she's going to get you on the next play after that one, which yeah. is awesome. Yeah, anyone who excels at multiple sports at that level is just looking for ways to express their competitive obsession, like always wanting to get advantage of anything. And yeah, it, yeah like for her being a track and field athlete at that level and then going to some beach, it's when I watch her set, I technically, obviously, she's very sound, right? Neutral posture, um, bent wrists, you know, quick release, but she doesn't approach it that way. She always, she's kind of peeking here and she's just doing things that are just effective. And I think some people might confuse some moves as flashy, but I think for her, it's like, okay, this is my advantage. I'm going to do it. Like, you know, simple things like don't be over on two off the net, maybe push the one. Um, she doesn't look frantic when she's doing athletic plays. They, they look very, very, very calculated. No, no doubt about it. She's from an athletic family. Her parents are both college athletes. Her mm. sister was a college athlete. Um, she came from a great high school program where they just won and won and won and won. Um, from a club program that she and, and uh, Adriana just dominated. Mm. Um, and it's really interesting. I, I went out her senior year. Um, after a certain, well, it used to be way back in recruiting, we used to do home visits before they committed. Hmm. Um, but that you couldn't do a home visit at that time until after they started their senior year. And so uh, I stopped doing home visits because the rules didn't allow it. The recruiting process got quicker than that and everybody made up their mind sooner. But I started doing some home visits just to get to know them better. Mm -hmm. And so I went to Jenna's hometown in the spring of her senior year and they had a big track meet that day. And I'd read a little bit about her being a state champion and the javelin and all this. And her sister's boyfriend was the javelin coach at her high school. And uh, he got her to go out and she won the state championship as a junior, set the state record. It was wow. a new sport in her state. Um, and I went out to watch her throw the javelin and she, like through 160 feet that day or something, which was ridiculous. It was considerably further than any of the male or female athletes that were in the meet that she threw in. Wow. And she just different than javelin throwers who've been heavily, heavily trained. She kind of ran up and stopped and then threw it. She didn't know <laughs> how to translate her speed into her. You know, I didn't look like she just had a gun for an arm. She's just a ridiculous athlete and a competitor. Um, and then she went and the, the javelin coach talked to me and I said, she's, get, she's coming on a volleyball scholarship. So it's okay with me to, for her to do what she's going to do. It just can't interfere and it can't overdo her things in her body. So she gets injured because mm -hmm. of it. That's just not going to be good for anybody. And so she played in the sand. Some she didn't continue that the whole way through, but her, I think it was her junior year. Um, she placed second in the NC2A track meet and it was like 20 feet further than her lifetime best at that point in the finals which who does that under that yeah. that's like bob beeman's long jump in mexico city way back when when he jumped a foot farther than anybody had ever jumped i think it was but it was truly a remarkable event and she only practiced like once a week the whole season for the <laughs> for the track team in the spring um and yeah she's got some really really special things about her and two totally different sports like that that's a real rarity yeah uh, there's a lot of volleyball basketball players in our past mm -hmm. um but Kristen Focal was ridiculous at Stanford playing both sports um uh, Lindsay Yamasaki but not javelin thrower volleyball player <laughs> and the best in the country at it at both of them yeah that's nuts and even positionally, I mean, setter is not a rotation heavy movement. 
and then you go and rotate your whole body, you know, in javelin, that's two so different biomechanics. Dynamic athlete. She was a really good hitter in high school. She and Adriana both had to hit and mm. um, she just has a gun. Fast twitch, different than plumbers. Plumbers is kind of strength based. It looks heavy, to me heavy ball. very heavy. And Jen is just a whip. Um, amazing. Man, I wish I could have seen. I wish just for one game you would have devised something where she could run a 6-2 and hit front row. I would have loved to see her hit because I didn't know that. Because, you know, based on her frame, she's, she's just thin framed. And the way she, I mean, for setting, you don't have to max jump all the time. And then she's not a jump server. So I think I never got a chance to see that, that arm. So I wish, I wish I could have seen that. Right. Yeah, for me, I was glad that they didn't get her into jump spin serving because as a setter, she probably could have done it. Hmm. Um, but throwing the javelin, all she's done, putting the different stresses she's put on her shoulder. The jump float, if you have good technique, is a little easier on your whole body. And so I'm kind of glad that she didn't end up doing that. But you know what? If we let her jump spin serve or trained her to help to do it, you and I both know she might have been pretty good at it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your last year at Stanford, you have that group that I think everyone knows you could have continued to win, you know, multiple group championships with that group. What made you decide to, to retire at that time, knowing that you had this, this fresh group of freshmen that did so well? Right. And it, it was really tempting. I mean, who wants to leave in that situation? I mean, they, they, they're all fun to coach. Mm -hmm. Just getting to know them. I mean, I only knew them for four months. And, you know, you know people through the recruiting process, but you don't really get to know them until you're doing what you're doing with them yeah. in the gym and, and going through things with them. Um, and it would have been great to just to continue through with them. Um, and, you know, I know that I'm smart enough to have changed things up, to, that repeating is hard, but I've been through that before um and knew a lot about it had a lot of fun talking to bill walsh about it when he was on the staff at stanford there and um and kevin did a great job with the team there's no doubt about it um but there were different timelines that were heading my way i have two grandkids and when they're 15 they don't want to be spending time with grandpa they want to be spending time with their friends and so there's a window that was open for me to to be able to spend more time with my kids, spend more time with my wife, who's been very patient with me being gone a lot my whole life. Um, you know, half the, the weekends of the year with recruiting and playing, you're gone. Yeah. And that's, she's a wonderful, patient woman, but I owed her and I, I knew that. And I wanted to be part of my grandkids' lives. I wanted to continue to have that grow my part of my life with my my uh my own my two daughters and with julie my wife and so it was those two timelines not going together the longer i coached the less i i was going to have a chance to do that and so i got to a point where i had to ask myself when i'm 75 or 80 am i going to care whether i want my a team i coached won one more championship mm -hmm. and i had to say that weighed with my family um there was no comparison yeah. Um, yeah, there were moments that were painful that I watched them their first year and I knew how fun I, much fun I would have had coaching them. Um, not, you know, for a lot of reasons. One is just walking into the gym, watching Jenna be a total goofball again. Um, cause she's really nutty. Um, really <laughs> a fun personality helps make the whole team be relaxed. But then when they don't bug her, when she's playing, she just wants to just crush people. Yeah. Uh, I want, I will, it would be fun to see that some more and yeah. be around it and watch Plummer do the things that she did. And, and Morgan hints, I mean, how do you get anybody that digs those balls with that control? Mm -hmm. there, there's, there's, in my mind, there's very few, if anybody, other people, if, if any other players that are like that. I missed a lot and it would have been cool, but what I got to do was really, really cool too yeah. with my family. Yeah. I think that's awesome. And I really admire that um, you've made that choice because, and it doesn't sound like it was, uh, it sounds like you just made something that would give you more joy at this point of your life. You know, your family being there with your, your grandkids and your, and, and giving back to your wife. Um, 
So are you, is, is family mainly what you're been occupied with now or are there other projects and objectives um, outside of art of coaching that you're doing right now? Um, you know, I, I decided to whatever might come my way in the volleyball world. Um, I just, I decided to uh, see what would happen. I'd gotten advice along the way from different people that once you retire, don't try to stay in it. Mm. Don't go coach in the USA program. If you're retired, be retired unless you're retiring to go coach at some, mm. some USA team, something like that. If they would have been interested in me and, and, uh, um, so, uh, I kind of let things come my way. So I've done some consulting with other colleges, um, with some club teams, um, with some different people, even outside of the sport of volleyball, just coaching stuff. Yeah. Um, and I've enjoyed that. I love to play golf still. Um, and, uh, you know, the last month or so I've spent a good amount of time with, on seventh grade algebra with my grandson. <laughs> so it's been fun um, helping in my granddaughter's club, um, helping like train coaches in the club. And, and uh, I'm looking forward to that when they can be more active again, when we get through this a little bit more because um, she's a eighth grader and I love watching her play. She's a setter and like her grant, her mom and her auntie. And she's, she's good. She has a good, we spent a lot of time playing volleyball together. I just wanted her to have fun. And so we play pepper in the living room all the time. And there's lamps and stuff that, that are in danger every time. But <laughs> it never happens because, you know, I'm not a volleyball player, but I can play pepper with my granddaughter and she's good. So, um, yeah, it's been fun. So I'm doing a variety of things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's really great to hear. And um, I, I'm just glad that you're at a place where, you're still in a joyful place because I know a lot of people that leave such expertise struggle to find that. I think they're still looking for that edge in another place. You know, like, I mean, you see this all the time with pro athletes, right? The next steps, but it just sounds like this transition has just been an upgrade of, of where you're at, which is, which is really ideal. Something very different. And, you know, if I hadn't had so many people in my life that it just blessed me with their blessings and, um, their patience with me and they're, they're helping me. Um, I might not have been so inclined to, to want to, you know, want, know that I, I have to spend time with my wife more and differently than, than we've spent it. And she never asked for that. Mm -hmm. I mean, but she deserved that. She's a wonderful person. Um, and, uh, so yeah, that's, I got lucky and made the right decision with the, it's the right thing to do at the right time. So, yeah. Yeah. So um, we got uh, two more questions here as we, we close up. Okay. Um, do you have a favorite underdog story? Uh, Cause part of our, part of elevate yourself is kind of an underdog theme. Like I'm, I'm a short outside hitter. Uh, I just try to create content that's just going to inspire people to achieve more than what people expect of them. So do you, do you have a favorite underdog story either from, you as a basketball player, as a coach, something, you know, a story, you know, from another person that, that you can uh, leave us with. Wow. That's a good one. I'll just take one that's at the top of my mind that um, Cassidy Lickman, when she was nine or 10, um, she found out she had this, I, they, I don't even know if they still, even after doing so many experimental things with her while she was at Stanford and before that, she had this thing happen in her leg. It's probably nerve based, but they can't find it. And I mean, she, she was basically in a cast, I guess, for a year when she was a little kid. Um, and they never have solved it. Mm. She's, I would b bet that most of us can't understand the kind of pain that she's in every day. And when she works out harder, it's worse. Mm. Um, and um, she could have quit when she was 10 doing what she, anything that, that was physical because it just made it worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's absolutely that person that persevered through it, that worked through it, that strived. You know, she's not the, the typical All-American USA team pro in Europe player that's bigger, faster, stronger, higher. 
I mean, she's 5'11", six foot, and she's a very fine athlete, but uh, she would even probably admit that she's a different kind of fine athlete than maybe what Feluca is. And um, she out-thought, out-worked, out, uh, she was curious about how to be better, how the game worked in different ways, in different levels that maybe I haven't thought about before. Um, always asking questions, walked into my office one day in the, the end of her freshman year, start of her sophomore year, and uh, said, coach, you got time? I just want to talk to you about setting. Let's talk about setting. Let's talk about offense. And so we spent time talking our way through the whole offense, which is something whenever I talk to people about setting, I give them this thing that Cassidy and I made up together, which is picking every set and deciding what in our offense is going to make that set successful. So what's the point of this play? Like, what's the point of running a one? With the group of people we have, Washington, when Coach McLaughlin was there, he set a one a totally different way. They set it the height of a two, and they hit it completely different. Mm -hmm. And we hit it as fast as anybody hit it. So our purpose was different. And so what makes it work? What's the setter's responsibility? And what's the hitter's responsibility? So that we can all understand it and not sit and argue about why sets don't work. We should not do it and know why the set didn't work. And so we came up with that. It was four, four typed pages, a description of our offense for those three things about each of the different 15 sets or 16 sets that we ran. Mm. Um, that's just who she is. And that means that's a 19 or 18 year old kid outworking almost anyone else in the country. Um, and her teammates looking at her knowing that they can't even understand what this feels like to her. And she's going just as hard as everyone is. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's the kid for every kid to want to be like, yeah. um, and she's um, written some amazing blogs. Um, she's, she's some of the stuff she's written for USA volleyball and for herself. Every kid should read. They're mm -hmm. remarkable. So that's not necessarily an underdog. Well, I guess it is. Yeah, I it's an inspiring that, story. It's mm -hmm. an inspiring story. Yeah. Yeah. Someone with her physical ailment is not supposed to play at this level. And it's not even just playing at this level like that. It's, it's playing a variety of positions at one of the top programs in the nation and being really good at all three of them yeah. and then coaching at that level um so yeah. yeah that's that's a huge underdog story and i remember when i first read that article in stanford about cassidy lickman and her her uh her leg i, I would have never guessed just watching her no one would ever yeah. guess no. you just see her on the floor flopping around and sprinting and just going after everything yeah i i'll i'll never forget um after her last match her senior year that we lost at the regionals um 17 to 15 in the fifth to usc wow. and they went to the final four and we went home it was two flights up the sterile the spiral staircase in this gymnasium we're in this arena and i walked up between she and alex and gabby who had to go to the press conference and she could barely make it up the stairs man um, it was, you just, I kind of looked at her like, I'm glad we lost. Cause I can't imagine mm. you having to play another match here. <laughs> so. yeah. Man. yeah. Great story for, for all those that, um, follow volleyball and, and that that's almost like a, of course you would never wish that on anybody, but that's almost like a, a dream player you would want to have on every team because they yeah. really set a standard. Nobody else can complain when, when she's going through this and working harder than you and, and, there's nothing to be said. She just sets a great example. Yeah. And you know, on, on every team, there probably is that person. Hmm. Um, what happens though, is one of the things that I got into when I was a younger coach and I tried to be really careful with it and good with it is to not assume things about people. Hmm. When you watch how they're acting, you're watching how, what, what they're doing and how they're doing that you're allowed to have this feeling about them because you're assuming what's there, what the reason is. Mm. she's not going as hard as she usually does. She's dogging it today, mm. which Cassidy didn't do. I'm just making that scenario up. 
Um, but that idea of making assumptions about people of we know why this is true about them when we probably don't. Mm. And there probably is that kid on this team that is on every team that, that is like that. We just don't know it. Mm. Very true. No, that, that's, that's great um, for, for me to keep in mind and for all the coaches listening out there is uh, not, not to assume. And, and, assume. and yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't assume you understand. If you have a feeling, ask questions to try to figure out why. Mm. Don't assume you know because you're smart and you're yeah. observant. I mean, I thought I was those things, and then how many times was I wrong? Uh huh. You know, and uh, but yeah, that's a that's a good good thing about coaching is to commit yourself to that. Yeah. One thing I learned from from myself is kind of one of my blind spots is early on if I just assumed everyone thought like me, it's like oh if I if I could do that or if I if I work that hard, they should be able to work this hard, and not taking myself out of myself and realizing that there are so many different ways of working hard. There's different approaches, and yeah. there's different reasons why people work hard, and and to assume that just because it looks good to me should be good to everyone else is, is, is really narrow minded. Yeah. I mean, a little story that people will understand because she just finished playing is Morgan Hintz. Mm. I mean, for a lot of reasons that I may understand or may not, um, she has a work ethics that's hard to imagine that I remember this could be a story I made up, but it's the way I remember it. I remember in the first practice, Inky, walking over to me and saying something like, we're all in trouble, coach. And I said, why? These freshmen are really good. I think it's a good thing, Inc. And she said, yeah, but Morgan works too hard. She's going to make all <laughs> the rest of us have to work harder. Um, and Morgan literally worked as hard as she possibly could on every play of every practice and game of the whole season. Yeah. And her teammates knew it and looked at her like, that's not possible. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I know how many bruises she has and I know how much she's hurting at this moment because we're going really hard training right now Yeah, and she, it doesn't stop her. She's still going to go. It doesn't matter if that ball dropping in this drill doesn't matter or not. She's going to go get it anyway. Yeah. And she may turn around after a while and look at you like, why didn't you go? Mm -hmm. Because she had the right to demand things out of a teammate if they weren't going hard and she was going that hard on every single play. Yeah. It's like, if you're going to demand things out of your teammates, you better set the example and never have an excuse. Yeah. Because if you're going to ask them to go hard, you have to do it no matter what. And she's one of the rare ones that absolutely did it no matter what. Yeah. And that kid deserves all the good things that can happen to them in their life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's on another level. And I think for a lot of people, it's, it's mentally, emotionally taxing to put that much focus effort and desire and belief really I mean, you see this at the international level where you see a ball shanked 30 feet away and if five players are just sprinting their butts off and they all slam the floor it's impossible to get and they're all slamming the floor afterwards saying why didn't we get that <laughs> on every play yeah. yeah but it's it's yeah it's it's like taxing on our nervous system to exert 100 percent every time and and so for her to handle that that's i would love to do some type of study on her like some type of emg yeah, yeah. <laughs> to study what her brain waves look yeah, like her brain's wired yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah no doubt about it you know when the great players are you know i've coached a lot of amazing players and that's one of the cool things is the what they do in in practice and especially in games that you just look at and go that's just amazing mm -hmm. because they're willing to do what it takes to take at that level and they're able yeah. you know we've all seen that the play of the high, I think she's a high school kid that ran to the back of the court and jumped over a teammate and played it backwards over her head, 40 yard, you know, Oh, you know, I mean, you know, the, know the play I'm talking yeah, about, right? Uh -huh. How can you not look at that and go, Oh crap, I need to go harder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so motivational to watch. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So do you have any uh, last piece of advice for our, lis our listeners? Well, I don't know. I, volleyball is such a cool game. You know, I mean, it, for me, it was cool to coach. I was never a player. I tried to learn how to play and 
and I quickly got out of the way and didn't play in front of my team because they would just really <laughs> question my, you know, my, who I am if they saw how I played compared to them. Um, I, volleyball is just such an amazing game. Uh, I, you know, I think the only thing I would say is um, let's go bigger than this. And I, I don't get political with anything, but let's all try to heal, heal the world. You know, the world is split apart in a lot of ways right now, and let's just heal it. The, the virus has challenged the whole world. It's one of the first things since the world wars that the whole world has been involved in, you know, mm -hmm. and suffering from the same way. And, um, you know, maybe the right thing for me to do would be to end on talking about volleyball, but I, I I think we all need are going to have to help. We're all going to have to help with this and find a way to um, to figure out what we can do to heal things and, and and make the world be something better than what it is to what or what it appears to be to everyone right now. Hmm. And uh, so I think that's a worthwhile thing to just join in on. And um, and. You know, volleyball is a pretty joyous thing that can can help you help bring teams together. Well, we have to look at at a lot of bigger things right now and bring us together. I think, and I think it could, we could all help each other. Yeah, very true. I think thanks for uh, putting just everything in perspective, um, and and it's good for us to re to remember that for sure. Well, and you, I've done some di different discussions about coaching with people. I want to thank you because you're very easy to uh, have a conversation with. And I think you're, you're trying to put things out there for people to see that will help them enjoy the game more and maybe learn more and that, all that. So thanks to you too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, just thank you for being a part of this. And yeah, part of, you know, I've been so blessed with this YouTube channel to have a, a wide reach, like almost 400,000 subscribers now. That's and awesome. only 25% is from the USA. The rest are from the wow. rest of the world. It's crazy. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I try to, to give people access to things that I didn't have access when I was younger. Not to say that my entire audience is younger. I have, I have a pretty big range. But, you know, why not make things? That I've, like, just like you've said so many times, there are countless n number of people that have invested in me without asking anything for return. And this right. is just one of the many ways that I can give back to more people and, and, and pass it on. That's great. Yeah. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. Thanks again for talking. Um, you know, my wife is actually from Stockton. So sometimes we go to uh, Lodi for lunch at, uh, gosh, there's an Italian deli that we love going. Uh, I, I'm drawing a blank. We go there almost, like once a month. Really wow. good sandwiches. Can't remember it now. You know what I'm talking I, about? I, my life is just north of there. I'm in Lodi now. So I, I, I head down to UOP quite a bit, though. Okay. For, for the program? Um, yeah, going to games. And I like their coach, Greg. I like their whole staff. And mm. it's fun to talk. And I've talked to coaches in other sports there. Okay. Um, and... Uh, yeah, I, it's, I just, I have a very good feeling about UOP. I love the time that I coached there. Yeah. Yeah. Great campus. We, so um, my wife, she's from Stockton and her, she was raised there and she was actually raised by her great grandma. So we go there every weekend to, to help take care of her. And uh, we actually eat on the UOP campus because, you know, we can't eat in restaurants. So we'll buy food to go and we'll take yeah. her outside. And it's, it's just such a beautiful campus. Um, and we love sitting there and just enjoying the trees and, and, and the architecture so it, it, it's a special place for sure now is the place you're talking about john's deli you know that's what? on the miracle mile about a mile from campus um no that, let me that is, is a that is a great one if you get a chance you should eat there john's i have deli. the same sandwich that i've, I've had a thousand times I, every time i go there still i have the same sandwich it's awesome okay <laughs> I'll keep that in mind because we're always looking for, you know, Stockton is such an awesome city. Uh, it's unfortunate with the crime, but there's so it's such a historical city and so many great pockets of neighborhoods, yeah. like established fam restaurants that have been there for, you know, 60, right. 70, 80 years. Um, yeah. Lots of great parks. Um, so, so I just looked it, it up. Your, what was that? 
Fiore, oh, Fiore Italia? Yeah, Fiore's Butcher Shop in Lodi. Oh, Fiore, oh Fiore's Butcher Shop. Okay. That oh, is I'll one of our favorite. Out. And they make, um, they have, they buy a lot of locally uh, produced products like Bruno's Peppers is locally produced. Um, and they buy all their produce is from local farmers. So the tomato, it's hard to find places with good tomatoes. Usually they just taste, taste like water, but their tomatoes are really good because they get it sourced locally. So, so Bruno's Peppers, there's a story. I got to town and, and Ron Bruno, the, uh, um, he uh, was the president of the Volleyball Boosters Club. Hmm. Wow. So I know him really well. I got all kinds of pep Bruno's peppers <laughs> in our closet downstairs. They're so good. Uh, they are <laughs> off the charts. They're so good. Uh, one of my favorite sandwiches is a uh, French roll with roast beef and Bruno's peppers on it. Hmm. Just that. Just simple. Just, yeah. yeah, you're right. Just take a Bruno's pepper and wrap it with salami and pop it in there and eat it. So great grandma doesn't can't handle spicy food, but for some reason she'll eat Bruno's peppers. I don't, I don't understand that. It's not like Bruno's are really that spicy, but for someone that has zero tolerance, <laughs> that's how good they are. <laughs> yeah. There's a great bed bread company in, in uh, Stockton too, is, um, Geneva bakery. Okay. Um, they make great rolls and stuff. And that's part of that company is part of the Bruno family as well. Wow. They're, okay. Uh, the pepper farm or the pepper factory is, is only a couple of miles from our house here in Lodi. They're between Stockton and Lodi. Wow. Okay. So John's deli on miracle mile. John's and then deli. Geneva's bakery. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And then if, and then right. you got to try a Fiori's butcher shop in Lodi and, and let me know what you think of, I always get extra sprouts. If you like sprouts, their sprouts are pretty good too on the sandwiches. Cool. And they, well, I hope we have a chance to talk again. It'd be fun. I love to talk coaching. So Call me yeah. up and say, let's talk about offense today. That'd be fun. I'm, I'm totally down. I can nerd out on volleyball forever. So I appreciate that offer. Cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Nice chatting right. with you again. You bet. Be safe out there. You too.